This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the LA 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today I'm so excited because I will be talking to Jessica Rains, the daughter of Claude Rains, the legendary character actor going back to the 1930s. It's the 90th anniversary of The Invisible Man, the Universal Monster classic he was the star of. That was his first movie in America in 1933. And, of course, he was also in The Wolfman, and it's the 80th anniversary of his version of Phantom of the Opera. And we're going to talk about that stuff today, celebrate his legacy a little bit, and talk about her acting career as well. She's been in so many great movies. Koch, um... Uh, Sarah T, Portrait of a Teenage Alcoholic, Oh God, Book Two, Islands in the Stream, Honky Tonk Freeway, The Wildlife, and Woody Allen Sleeper turning 50 this year. She's the woman in the mirror, and we're going to get into all of that today, and I cannot wait. Oh my God, I'm a huge fan of The Invisible Man and all those Universal Monster movies, as you all know, and it's going to be a great conversation today. Also, rest in peace, Jeff Beck. He, um, it's, it's been reported in the last hour or two that he passed away, and it's really sad. That guy was an innovative guitar player. You know, Truth is one of the best albums of the 60s and one of the best albums of all time. You know, he's got Rod Stewart on vocals. He's just strumming away on that guitar. And Jeff Beck was just, he was so underrated, yet he was a guitar hero to most people in rock. So rest in peace, Jeff Beck. So yeah, here is my interview with Jessica Rains. Welcome to Brady, Southern California. <laughs> hey Jessica, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good, how are you? I am spectacular. This is uh, such a tremendous honor. Thank you for taking the time today. I'm happy to. Awesome. So, going back in time, I can imagine, uh, growing up the daughter of legendary, iconic character actor Claude Rains, that it was only natural that you would act as well. Well, I don't think anybody thought it would happen. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was quite by accident. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he, he didn't encourage you to go into acting? Well, I was in, in college in, in Vermont. Uh-huh at a girls' college, and nearby was Williams College, which was a men's college, and they had a very good drama department, but no women. Mm -hmm. So the head of the drama department somehow found out that I was at Bennington and sent a very cute redhead <laughs> 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 to come and persuade me to be in a show. And I'd never done any theater before. Mm -hmm. I was, I guess, 18, maybe 19. And um, I met a lot of very cute boys in the theater department. <laughs> <laughs> but I never thought that I, would, that I would be interested in doing it professionally. And then it got me. It hooked me the way it hooks people. Yeah, and so um, when my father said to me, what are you going to do after college? I said to him, I want to be an actress. Mm -hmm. And he said, and how are you going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, I would like you to give me a year in New York. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay. But he said, you have to do everything that you can do to be a better actress. You have to take classes, you have to take acting classes, singing classes, dance classes, fencing classes, I thought, what fencing? Falling down classes, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and he, you have to work. You have to get jobs backstage and put in your time. Yeah. And that's what I did. Wow. Yeah, because I had read that uh, you grew up stuttering and it was what, singing that cured it? Singing. Yeah, everybody yeah. sang in our house. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my f mother would say, pass the peas <laughs> to the dinner table. Everybody sang. And, and my stutter wasn't 
so awful that it took a great deal of time. Yeah, uh, that's beautiful. If only we could hear hiccups that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you, you grew up primarily on a farm in Pennsylvania? Grew, yes, yes. And then when he was working, we got on the train mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. four days and four nights across country yeah. to come to Los Angeles where he would work and I went to school here, and I don't know what my mother did. And, and then we went back to the farm where he, he really was happy. And you told everybody he was a farmer. <laughs> and I, well, I thought he was, that's what he was to me. I mean, that was the main thing, was that he was a farmer. That's, that's... And he was on a tractor. I mean, he was, he was working. Yeah, that that's good. You know, at least you had that vision of your dad and not. And I was in charge of the chickens, and I hated them. Oh yeah, <laughs> they probably stink. That's why. Well, no, it's because they. I had to go and collect eggs. Oh. And they don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> they, they flutter and cackle at you, and I didn't like it at all. But that was my job, so I had to do it. Yeah. Wow. Well. <laughs> you know, you know what's impressive about your dad is that not only he got to be in three iconic Universal monster movies, but he also got to escape a lifelong career of typecast, unlike Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi did. It's it's amazing. Right. Well, you know, he was under contract to Warner Brothers for a while. You probably know how long. I'm not so sure, but years. A long time, yeah. And the, and the deal was that if he they would offer him uh, uh, two films and if he turned the two films down he had to take the third one Mm -hmm. so they that was a way to make him do what they wanted him to do they would offer him two films that were absolute crap and he would turn them down and then the third one was the one that he had to do so there were some films that were not to his liking there along the way yeah, and in those days, too, Universal was a B-movie studio, and if you were Clark Gable or somebody, and you you know, you know mouthed off to Louis B. Mayer, he would say, do that again, I'll send you to Universal. <laughs> oh, that's very funny. I didn't know that. That's a true story. <laughs> that's very funny. Huh? Yeah, and it's funny, too. Um, you know, I've had Sarah Karloff and Bela Lugosi Jr. on here, and like you, they were born in 1938, and their fathers were also over 50. It's bizarre how your dads all paid their dues to, to get stardom, and then, you know, uh, once the biological clock was ticking, you know, 1938 was the golden year. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's wonderful. So, it's the 90th anniversary of The Invisible Man, uh, your dad's first movie. Uh, what a part for a first movie. I think um, he should have won the Academy Award for this role, because he was like the original Elephant Man, in a way. You know, he conveyed so much aggression and emotion through those bandages and sunglasses. Yeah, it's quite amazing, and it, and it, and it still holds up, I think. It does. It does. It's a timeless movie. Uh, did he ever tell you how he got that role of Jack Griffin? Um, he to- what he told me was that they were looking for somebody to play this part, and they were screening tests that actors had done, mm-hmm. looking for somebody. And in the next room, or the next screening room, uh they were screening some other tests having nothing to do with this movie. Mm -hmm. And he heard the voice. Mm -hmm. He heard Claude's voice, and he said, that's it. And apparently he had done a test. He was with the Theater Guild in New York, and they had brought him out to to, to Los Angeles to do a test. And apparently the test was awful. because he was doing his theater thing, which is not the same as acting, right. you know, for the screen. And it was, and, and they were sort of laughing at this test, and the guy said, I want, that's, that's the voice I want. And that was it. Interesting. Yeah, there's that story out there that uh, he took you to see the, re-re- the re-release in 1950, and everyone in the theater was watching him explain the movie to you instead well, of watching it. Well, it was crazy. It. 
I mean, he yeah. thought that he wasn't going to be recognized. And it was in the winter, and he was all bundled up in a, in a coat and a scarf and a Hamburg hat that they all wore then. And and we were sitting in the back row, and he couldn't keep his mouth shut. He, <laughs> <laughs> he wanted me to know how all the special effects done were done. And he was explaining it to me. Oh, and the, that vo- I mean, you can't miss that voice. Mm-hmm. So everybody knew that he was in the theater. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's very funny. Yeah, well, there was there was there was no consequences in those days, you know. I mean, celebrities, you know, there was no internet. Celebrities could go do anything they wanted, and it wasn't it wasn't like it was going to be on the news the next day, you know. Right, right. Yeah, what, what did you think being that young and seeing your dad on screen in that role? I have to tell you that I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Um. I really don't remember, but I I still thought he was a farmer. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he spent most of his time, is in my mind, doing, because we spent most of our time in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he just, he brought a lot to this, to this H.G. Wells story, and he had the amazing James Whale, uh, who had directed Frankenstein in 1931 and The Mummy in 1932. He was on fire with these universal horror movies at the time. And right. I'm sure, I'm sure at that age, you, you, you probably just looked at it just objectively and like, was, was like, oh, my dad's a farmer and here he is in a movie. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Yeah. I, I don't remember what I thought. Do you remember the first time you saw it as an adult? Um, no. No. That that ending where he goes from invisible to visible. Oh, in the it's hospital fabulous! Bed. Yeah, it's fabulous. I yeah. I know that what I thought was, what I think now is how beautiful he was. Yeah. You know, I mean, the face was just perfect. <clears throat> he was, and um, <clears throat> and that, of course, is the only time that he appears. You know that you can see him in the film. Yeah, it just it, for nineteen thirty three. Those were great special effects. You know, it's it's got to be like one of my favorite endings of all time. It's, right. It's just so beautifully haunting, is what it is, and it gives it gives him a lot of dignity too. Um, so then, eight years later, he does the Wolf Man, where he plays Sir John Talbot. Oh, uh, uh, I I never saw mm-hmm. any of those films oh, as yeah. a as a child. Yeah. Um, and he didn't either. He was not interested in the final product. He was only interested in the in in the job in acting, which he loved. Right. But he didn't really, you know, we didn't go to the movies, mm-hmm. and we didn't have a television set, mm-hmm. and um, we lived on a farm in a very remote area. Right, and um, and he his his life in Chester County, Pennsylvania, was with other farmers. Right. I mean, I'm not saying they didn't know who he was, but they really didn't care. Right. Oh, in in, in the Midwest, you know, in the, the the southern places, yeah, they don't really care if you're a celebrity or not. They're just you know simple folks. They want to talk about when the crops are going to be planted and <laughs> when exactly. the cattle are going to be sold. And it was a big farm. It was 600 acres. I mean, he wasn't fooling around. Yeah, I mean, they called them show folk. They're like, we got show folk in this town, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. But yeah, I mean. I mean, he's great in The Wolf Man, you know. And did he, did he ever it, it, ever talk about that one at least? No. 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 And of course, you know, uh, the Phantom of the Opera. I, I like that version. You know, a lot of people are are purists of the nineteen twenty five version with Lon Chaney Senior, but I like the the nineteen forty three right. version as well. Yeah, I do too. I think him and Nelson Eddy both did a, a great job. Right. Yeah, and this and this was like the only Universal Monster movie that didn't have the logo at the beginning, which I thought was interesting. Right, I didn't know that actually. It didn't. 
Yeah. About it. If he, he if he didn't take you to the movies, I mean, obviously. He, Never. Yeah. If he didn't do that, obviously, though, he was proud of the Invisible Man to t- to take take you to it at least. Well, I think the fact that it showed up in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. uh, which is a very small farm community, was was interesting enough, and maybe he wanted to see it. Yeah. That, that could be possible as well. What What's your favorite of your dad's movies? I think Deception. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I love Casablanca. Mm-hmm, same here. Um, but I think I love Deception. Yeah, I love um, The Invisible Man, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, because I love Jimmy Stewart. Right. Yeah. Jimmy Stewart, at one point, mm-hmm. he we had a house here in California that uh-huh. he would come to, that we would come to when he was working, and Jimmy Stewart lived across the street, and um, mm-hmm. my relationship with Jimmy Stewart was that when he came to the end of the driveway in his pajamas to pick up the paper in the morning, mm-hmm. he would just look up and kind of nod at me if I was... <laughs> <laughs> If I was within nodding distance. Yeah. A great man, I've heard. Um, I also love uh, The Adventures of Robin Hood, um, Casablanca, as you said. And Here Comes Mr. Jordan, which, funny, James Mason played Mr. Jordan in the remake with Warren Beatty, uh, Heaven Can Wait. Yes, I saw it. Yeah, and I talked to um, James Mason's grandson about that. It, Mason, he brings tears to my eyes at the end when he's informing him that he has to stay on, the, stay on Earth as, a, as another man and stuff. Right. Yeah. So going back to you as an actor too, I also know you were you were close friends with Susan Strasberg. Well, she lived across the street too. I mean, there mm-hmm. was a you know or across and up the street a little bit, and we grew up together. And uh, her father, Lee, was very weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, he never sat down at the dinner table. He always mm-hmm. stood up and ate. And was reading something, something about the theater, I'm sure. And years later, when I was in New York, I wanted to study with him. Mm-hmm. He was the big, the big guy in New York. Yeah. And um, so I went to meet him, and I don't know if he knew who I, if, if he knew who I was, if he knew that I had been Susan's childhood friend, because I changed my name. My name was Jennifer, mm-hmm. and um, I changed it to Jessica. So I don't know whether he was aware of it, but he just, when you auditioned for him, you didn't audition, you just talked to, he just talked to you. And I was terrified. I mean, this was the big guy, you know, this was the big guru and everybody wanted to study with him. And he asked me, I remember this very clearly, who my favorite actor was. And I was so terrified that I couldn't remember the name of one person. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) But somehow I got into his class and I was studied with him for about four and a half years. Yeah. And Dustin Hoffman was in the class with me. He sat in the back row <laughs> and read the newspaper and never did a scene. Wow. <laughs> but I guess he uh, absorbed plenty because he's pretty terrific. Ugh, one of the greats, no question about that. Did you? Did I you... just saw, um, what's it called? Um, what was the first movie he did? The Graduate. Uh, we just saw The Graduate last week. Yeah. Um, he's amazing. He's just amazing. I know, and to this day he says that he was badly miscast and he's a little embarrassed about his performance, but he is uh, just uh, extraordinary in that role. Right. You know? Right. Yeah, and they wanted, like, Robert Redford or someone who was blonde-haired, you know, but no, he was perfect in that role, I think. And then there was a girl by the name of Meg Miles in the class, mm-hmm. and she had, <clears throat> she was like the sexy young starlet, right. and she came to New York to, quote, learn how to act, 
and she um, she played a lot of bad girls. Mm -hmm. And so Lee Strasberg would assign scenes that you would do and, and who your partner was. And he put me together with Meg a lot because I think he wanted me to learn how to be a bad girl. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I played all the kind of innocent parts. Mm -hmm. And I had a good English accent, so taste of honey and, you know, stuff like that. And Meg was, what, kitten with a whip? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> funny. Did you know John's wife, Wendy Gerard? No. Okay. I had her on back in November. And uh, she's she's a character. <laughs> she's got stories about about being around De Niro and all of them at the actor studio. Yeah, I know. I know you did um, a, a podcast with Drew Ann Perry, right? Yes. You know that I know her. Yes. Yes. Okay. How'd you meet Drew Ann? Uh, she was. We were. I was producing a movie. I became a producer when I stopped acting, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> we were looking. We were eating lunch, mm -hmm. and she was the server, the waitress. Mm -hmm. And um, the girl. There, there was a part in in the in the um, film where she was in a shower and it was really important that she be naked and uh, suddenly the girl who was going to be the lead and we were starting to film in two days decided that she didn't want to be naked hmm. so we went back to this restaurant where Drew Ann had, had, was serving us lunch and said what are you doing in two days and, <laughs> <laughs> and she packed up her stuff <clears throat> and was in this movie. <clears throat> what, and that's how it started. What what movie was that? I can't, I think it was called I can't remember what it was called. I did ten I did they were horror films, most of them, and I did ten of them in eleven years. Okay, I gotta ask about that later because you know I'm a big horror fan, so <laughs> Right. Wow, yeah, because I, I think she had like I don't know three movies on her IMDb, and we talked to, we talked about all three of them, so I'm sure one of them was on there. Right. But she is she's a, a great lady. Yeah, she's lovely. I'm but, still in touch with her. Mm -hmm, absolutely, I'm I'm connected with her on Facebook. Right. Did, did you do any um like Broadway theater or anything that you're proud of in New York? Did I? Yeah. I did a lot of theater, but not on Broadway. It was, I did a lot of summer stock. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of regional theater. I did off, off, and off, off Broadway plays. And um, then when I came to California, of course, nobody cares about the theater here. Yeah. And they certainly didn't then. So my resume with 52 plays on it didn't mean anything. Wow. And it was basically like starting all over again. Mm -hmm. In 1971, you got to be directed by Jack Lemmon in Koch. How was that experience? It was amazing. He was lovely. It was, mm -hmm. a, I think, the first and maybe only film he ever directed. And um, mm -hmm. and I played Walter Matthau's psychologist. Mm -hmm. And Walter Matthau was a hoot. I mean, he's just very charming and very funny. And yeah. um, and Jack Lemmon was lovely. And, you know, it was, it was a good experience. Yeah, I heard that Matthau, you know, he, he could say anything, and you don't know if he's serious or not, because he would just get so frustrated and angry. And it was just, it was funny either way, you know? Right, right. Yeah, he was unpredictable. Do you remember working with Deborah Winters or Daryl Larson? No. Okay. Deborah Winters and Daryl Larson, they've been on here. They they enjoyed working with Lemon and Matthau on that movie. Then you got to be directed by Jackie Cooper on Stand Up and Be Counted. Well, that was a that was a terrific experience for me because I had a it was the first woman's lib film that was ever done and and I don't think it's particularly good. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I was I was hired to be one of a group of women in a in a 
not a therapy group, but a, a, a group of women who sat around and bitched about being women and <laughs> how difficult it was. And, um, and I was uh, at home one day with, with a, I had a, a, a very young daughter and we had a play group and we were there and I got a phone call from my agent saying the girl playing whatever her name was got hit in the head in a riot downtown and they need a replacement so get over there right away. So I dumped my daughter and these other mothers and fl flew out of the house barefoot. Thank you very much. And went to the um, went to the studio, and and they replaced this girl with me. And it was a terrific little part. She was the foreman of a bra factory who, <laughs> who staged a riot. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and it was really fun to do. I had a good, terrific time. Nice. Yeah. That was, that and he didn't, he said to me at the end of the of the shoot, I can't remember how long I was on the film, maybe a week, yeah, m maybe less. And Jackie Cooper said to me, "I have a question to ask you." Mm -hmm. I said, "Okay." He said, "Are you related to Claude Rains?" <laughs> and I said, "Yes, he's my father." And he almost died because he had been when he was a child, he had been in a film with my father. Oh. And he said, um, I have a present for you. Jackie Cooper said, I said, what is it? And he said, wait until tomorrow. And when I went to work, he had a chair, you know, the director's chairs that everybody mm -hmm. sits in with my name. They got, he got in the art department to paint my name on the back of the chair. And that was exciting. Oh, God, what a class act. I, I, I know. Love, I love hearing stories like that. Yeah. And then he directed a bunch of, uh, there was a television series called Feather and Father mm -hmm. um, about two lawyers with Stephanie Powers and Harold Gould. Oh, God. <laughs> and he hired me to play the woman who ran the office that they worked in. Mm hmm and so that was really nice. I mean, that was a was a running part. You know, I, it certainly never appeared again. I you don't never see it. So maybe it was awful too. I don't know. <laughs> Harold Gould, what a funny guy that guy was. Yeah, yeah. You ha you had a recurring role on Days of Our Lives. Everyone tells me that when you do a soap opera, it's the hardest acting job because you got to memorize like. 50 pages of dialogue and if you fuck it up you're 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 out of there you're fired yeah but i it, it's weird because i had done one previously called secret storm in new york mm -hmm. and um when and when i was hired to do days of our lives i had a reputation as being somebody who could memorize a lot of lines mm -hmm. a lot of dialogue very quickly I mean, I could do 30 pages overnight. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> but, and so the, the memorizing of the lines wasn't really a problem to me. And in a soap opera, you just, every, you're just saying the same thing over and over again in a different way. You know, they can't move so fast or they would have nothing to say. So, you know, you would go to work one day and you would, and, and the next day you would just kind of, the script would just kind of repeat things that you'd already done, but saying in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, but the funny thing about that was that I was playing a drug, a drug dealer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not such a druggie, let me tell you. And so on the first day I had to, they gave me a spoon with a candle and some powder in it, and I didn't know what I was, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and the director said, could somebody show Jessica what to do? And of course, everybody was very quiet because you don't admit that you <laughs> go home and do drugs after a day's work. And finally, somebody crept forward and showed me what to do. It was very funny. Yeah, oh my God. Uh, you did an episode of Ironside. What was uh, Raymond Burr like? Um, 
I remember doing it. I don't remember anything about it. Okay. I I see a pattern here. You did a lot of like uncredited secretary roles in like Pete and Tilly, The Sting, Buster. I was everybody's secretary and everybody's mother and everybody's nurse <laughs> and everybody's psychologist. <clears throat> um. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just like were you like doing them for favors, like people you worked with previously? No, no, no. It's just that I just, you know, I got into this. I don't know what it was. It was, <coughs> you know, what my agent sent me up for, or what. Mm. I don't know. It's just, just what it was. Yeah, the Sting. Oh God, is a masterpiece. It's one of the most clever period pieces ever written, and yes, so and, funny. and when when I went to work on the Sting, he, the director brought um, Robert Redford and Paul Newman over. I was over. I was the secretary, of course, over to the desk where I was working to meet me. And I stood up, and I was about the same height that they were, and it was really shocking to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you imagine them as being giants because they're so beautiful and, you know, interesting. Yeah. Oh, God. It's a great movie. It's it's It holds up. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you even played a secretary in a two-part episode of Wonder Woman. Yes. Yeah, anything you remember about that? Uh, no. How's <laughs> <laughs> that? That's okay. Uh, I also, you know, I did a lot of commercials, uh -huh. um, which is a great way for an actor to, you know, uh, make to make money because oh, yeah. I don't know what it's like now, but then it was very good and the residuals were amazing. Oh yeah, and, back in the day, like big stars, they would get like millions for like endor endorsing products. Now I heard it's it's not even you know a hundred thousand dollars that they're lucky sometimes. Right. I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, then it was it was ama it was really amazing, and it and it wasn't uh, wasn't easy, but I had a very sort of normal look, and it it, it was at mm -hmm. the time when they were getting away from the little blonde, pretty girls with the turned up noses, yeah, <laughs> um, and hiring people who looked like they were picked up off the street. <laughs> and so, um, so I worked a lot, you know, which was great. Right. Um, what what products did you endorse that you remember? Oh God. Um, well, I did Pampers when I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. I did Space Sticks, which were a probably meatless product that they sent into space with the astronauts. Huh. Interesting. Um, it was just gross. Ew. <laughs> um, I did a Seven Up commercial. Yeah. I did. Um, I don't know. A lot. Just a lot. I can't believe Seven Up is still around. All the other lemon lime drinks are like more popular than Seven Up. You know, like Sprite. Right. You know, remember there was Slice back in the eighties. That went away yes. by like the yes. mid nineties. I like Slice the best out of all of them because it had like real juice in it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you um, get to be the woman in the mirror in Woody Allen Sleeper? Um, well, that was weird. Um, <laughs> The, the whole casting process is very, as I understand it, I mean, I'm not acting anymore, but in in those days, um, you got a call from your agent, you got in your car, you drove to the audition, um, and there were 10 or 12 women who looked kind of like you, and mm -hmm. you were given sides of a script and you read them and you auditioned and then you went home. Now, apparently, it's all done on video. Mm -hmm. 
And so then I got, a, at that time, I got a call from my agent, and she said, it's a Woody Allen picture, and get, get over there right away. Everything was always right away. And uh, so I went, and he was standing in the middle of a room with uh, two sort of secretary types on either side of him. And there were no chairs, there were no office, and I stood, and he asked me questions. He never looked at me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember what the questions were, but I'm sure it was about what I'd done as an actress and, you know, so forth and so on. And then he said to me, uh, do you have a picture of yourself? And I said, well, you have a picture because my agent sent it over. And he said, I need another one. Do you have it? And I said, yes. So I went to my car and I got the picture and brought it back and gave it to him. And then I went home and the phone was ringing saying I'd gotten the part. <laughs> so it was weird. I mean, he never looked at me. So then mm -hmm. I went to work. <clears throat> well, I think it was a two-day job. And one of the things that I had to do was to shave with a straight-edge razor. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I didn't have to shave with a straight edge razor, and I said to him, I don't know what to do with this. And he said, neither do I. <laughs> but somehow, he found somebody who knew, came and showed me, and he was, he was interesting because he trusts, he, he didn't direct that much. Yeah. You know, he directed in terms of placing you where he wanted you to be on the set. But... He trusted his actors, mm -hmm. and um, and that was that was very nice. Yeah, a, a lot of uh, directors who were actors, you know, that they're they're like that as well. They they put trust in the people they hire, right. and Woody is certainly that way. Yeah, I've never seen him with facial hair, so I'm not surprised that he didn't know <laughs> how to shave. Funny, I know. You know? You know, and he was flanked. Mm -hmm. He was sitting on a chair. Mm -hmm. A director's chair, high, uh, high off the ground, in mm -hmm. in front of me, in front of the set, and there were gorgeous girls, young girls, mm -hmm. sort of draped all around him, mm -hmm. and he didn't even he didn't pay any attention to them. Wow, it was weird. It was yeah. weird. <laughs> I've heard similar stories. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe because you know he's so anxiety ridden. Maybe that's his way of concentrating on the job. You know, right? Who knows? Right. You know, but it's absolutely one of my favorite Woody Allen movies, next to Annie Hall, and um, I just, I, I just like it. It's like it's like a Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin slapstick movie with a sci-fi theme. Right. I haven't, I, I haven't seen it for years. I mean, I. I should have a look at it again. Yeah, there's that, there's that, there's that party scene with the marijuana orb. They're all rubbing it right. and getting high. That kind of predated CBD oil in many ways. <laughs> right, exactly. It, it, pre it predicted the future. Then I did a film with George Scott. Mm -hmm. Islands in the Stream. Called Islands in the Stream, and yeah. um, that was a weird audition. It was a. It was a casting director that I knew because I'd done work, you know, I'd done things for him previously or gotten parts because I had auditioned for him or whatever. And he said, we had a conversation. There was nothing to read. I think I had one line in the movie. And uh, he, said, I, he said, I would love to have you, to hire you. He said the cast and crew are, are in Hawaii and they're, filming now on the island of Kauai, and he said, I'd love to send you, but I can't because I'm looking for somebody who's Czech. Mm -hmm. And I said, but my mother is Czech, which was absolutely true. And he said to me, do you have a passport? Mm -hmm. oh. So I mean, he wasn't going to hire me, and then when he heard that my mother was Czech, and therefore I was half Czech, he said, okay, you go. It was weird. It was just weird. Yeah, that is weird. I've I've heard that. Um, and uh, it was crazy because we were there for I was there for five weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time was spent dressed in rags as a Czech immigrant, dragging a boat, uh, which was 
uh, helmed by George Scott, up the Wailua River Mm -hmm. in mud. I mean, it was (laughs) not your dream job, but but it was crazy, you know, it was... Would you Another say, crazy experience. Would you say that was the worst acting experience you ever had? No. No. Because I had, you know, they were they were good people. Mm-hmm. And I was uh, Hildy Brooks was playing the other uh, immigrant, and we got we forged a friendship that lasted for years, and um, she was a lot of fun. And the other, you know, I mean. We were in Hawaii. What could be bad? Mm, absolutely. Hawaii. I've never been there, but a great place from what I've been told. Right. How about uh, Sarah T., Portrait of a Teenage Alcoholic? Remember it, but can't tell you anything. Okay. Don't remember. I mean, I, I remember it, but I don't remember it. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you telling the uh, negative experience I had being Linda Blair once. <laughs> Right. I've told that story many times. Do you remember anything about Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman? Um, the part was written for me by Oliver Haley, who was a friend. And I had no idea that he was writing this part for me. She was a truck driver. And, um, and so when I went for the audition... He said to me, you don't need to audition, you have the part. Well, that was nice. You didn't even have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't know, I don't know, you I, I, You never see it. It's, I don't ever see it on television, do you? Do- There's like many clips of them on YouTube and, and, what, and so forth, but... I, I, I don't I don't know maybe I think me TV was playing them for a little while but I could right. be wrong. I could be wrong though but I've talked to Greg Malavy he's a sweet guy um, yes yes S- Samantha Harper she's uh, oh my God an angel I love her um, a couple people told me uh, that uh, Louise Lazar was very difficult don't know yeah. <laughs> yeah, a couple Saturday Night Live writers from the seventies told me she was the most difficult host, hands down, in that five years that they were there. Interesting. Yeah. I remember when you were the um, the friend of Marion Mercer and Oh God, Book Two. Right. Yeah, you're both, you know, watching her talk to Invisible God at the McDonald's, <laughs> and you're like, "Look, Helen, she's carrying on." Poor Tracy. <laughs> God, you know everything, don't you? <laughs> I do. I do. Sad to say, I do. <laughs> yeah, Gilbert Gilbert Cates directed that movie. Did you know? Did you work with him previously? Um, no, I did not. Yeah, but I remember good. Th- I mean, I remember feeling good about about the day. I think it was all done in a day and a in a weird part of town outside of L.A. How about how about the notorious Honky Tonk Freeway? Um, that was bizarre because <clears throat> we worked <throat> in a bank in downtown L.A. And when I got to work and parked where the sign said to park, there was a chalk outline of a body. Hmm. Uh, in the ground because and it was real I mean it wasn't something they had put there they weren't filming there somebody had um, bitten the dust that morning and they had put a chalk outline around him it was weird I never saw anything like that before yeah so that kind of creeped you out and you were like oh my god get me out of here I know yeah (laughs) what am I doing what did I sign up for yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, that movie had a great cast, but just like you know, it was it was a bad movie. But at least it was probably a career highlight for you to work with John Schlesinger, who did Midnight Cowboy. Right. Right. Do, do you remember anything about the wildlife? Um, I remembered that there were a lot of drugs going on on the set. Oh yeah. <laughs> which was weird. And um, I think Ron Wood was in the movie. That had something to do with what was going on. 
Well, it's a teen. It's a teen comedy. You know. You yeah. Got, you got Eric, Eric Stoltz and Chris Penn. God rest his soul. He was a talented guy. Right. Yeah, I grew up watching that movie, and I was like, "Oh, look, it's Jessica Raines playing the neighbor." <laughs> there she is again. Yeah. <laughs> playing a neighbor. <laughs> yeah. So I looked at your producing credits on IMDb. I can't believe I missed this when I was doing my research the other night, but I've seen a couple of these movies. Psycho Cop. Yes. Bobby Bobby Ray Schaefer, I've had him on. He's a very, yes. very interesting guy. He has his own time zone. <laughs> right. Yeah, what was that like working on that? Well, the whole thing about producing was amazing for me. I mean, I... I I went to the American Film Institute to learn how to produce. Mm -hmm. And um, when I got, I was there for a year, and then I thought, and I was the oldest person in my class <coughs> of 80 people. Mm -hmm. And when I got out, I thought, oh, I'll, this is going to be an easy gig for me. I'm going to get a job because I'm older and I'm more mature and I've been around and I've done all these movies and television and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And of course, nobody wanted to hire old. Yeah. You know, they're looking for kids. Right. So um, there was a woman in my class by the name of Darren Warren. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And she <clears throat> came to me and said, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I met a guy at a party. Mm hmm and he's got $60,000 to make a film. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And uh, are you interested in producing it? And I said, of course. And I didn't know if I could do a movie for $60,000, but I know that at AFI we learned every trick in the book about how to beg, borrow, and steal and, you know, figure out how to get stuff for nothing. So we filmed it uh, in my house in nine days. Mm -hmm. And um, at one point, and we were filming a lot at night. Mm -hmm. And at one point, uh, there was a knock on the door, and there were two policemen standing there. And apparently, a neighbor had called me because they were, thought I was running a whorehouse. Wow. <laughs> oh, so, that was pretty funny. Yeah. And... Um, and we got this thing done for a little bit less than $60,000. And then the producer had another one that he wanted us to do right away, which we did. And then we went to MeFed in Italy and sold these two suckers for about 300000 bucks. Wow. So the producer made a lot of money. And he went on to do whatever he did, and I went on to do whatever I did. But it was crazy, because it's it's very fast, and it's very, you know, it, you, you can't spend a lot of time doing anything if you're working this fast. Right. And um, I did 10 of them in 11 years, mm -hmm. which is a lot. Yeah. And I'm not sure, I'm not, I, I was, I was, I mean, because it was so low budget, I had a lot of jobs. I was cooking for everybody. I was doing the books. I was, uh, you know, doing a lot of stuff. If you're, if you're the kind of producer who sits behind a chair and behind a desk and makes decisions, that's another story. I'm not sure I would have been so good at that. I like having my hands in the pie. Yeah. That's you good. Know, that's good. There are problems, mm -hmm. you know, it, when you don't have money and you don't have time and um, and you're trying to get things for nothing and there are tricks that you do. For instance, if, you, if you're renting film equipment, if you rent it on Friday for a Monday morning shoot, then you film on the weekends anyway, which gives you two extra days. You know, so, I mean, but but it was fun. It was really fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, those low-budget, you know, uh, exploitation horror movies, they, they, they could be a lot of fun from what I've been told, but they could also, you know, be very stressing at the same time. Right. 
object. And the big mm-hmm. trick, what I did, I don't know if it was a trick, but I was always the first person on the set every morning because I figured if I was there when people arrived, then they wouldn't feel used. I mean, nobody was getting paid very much money. Everybody was working for nothing, including me. People were working for points. If the money, if the film made money, they made money, and it wasn't much. Mm-hmm. And um, so I just figured if I was there making coffee at 6 o'clock in the morning when people started to arrive, that they would they go, well, if the producer's here at 6 o'clock in the morning, then i got to be here, so, you know. Yeah. Also, uh, object of desire. I kind of remember that one. Tracy Lords. Wow. Nick, Nick well, Cash. that was never finished. That was never finished. That was. Um, so, we shot it in Belize. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was financed by a man who did not have all the money, mm-hmm. and he was going to the Cannes Film Festival to raise the rest of the money, and he couldn't raise it. So we were in Belize making this movie, and the money stopped coming. Okay, I'm thinking of another movie then, if it wasn't finished. Um, I do know an actress in it, though, who's been on, Helen Udy. Yes. Canadian yes. actress. Yeah. Did you, did you, did you uh, like working with her? I don't remember okay. that much. Okay. So... Uh, did you so you you got out of producing and then you just retired? I basically got out of producing because I was exhausted. Mm-hmm. You know, you're taking somebody else's money. Yeah. I don't care whether it's sixty thousand or two million or ten million or whatever it is, and you are basically responsible for handing over something that they can sell. And it's a huge responsibility, and uh, and and the respect, it, it just got to me. You know, I got I got tired. I got you know I was exhausted from it. And then um, I bought a piece of property on on a canal out here in Los in Venice, and we built we built a house. And I got very I was very involved with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was running it like like producing a low budget film, mm-hmm. and um, I just kind of didn't want to do it anymore. Didn't want to produce anymore. Mm-hmm. So, what do you got going on these days? Well, I'm 85 years old. What do you think I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> now you're retired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm retired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Do you, so has has the uh, the pandemic been you know an okay experience for you? Have you lost hope? It was, it was okay for me. Mm-hmm. Um, my partner Jack and I had all the shots and all the posters, and we got COVID. Oh my God! But it happened to a lot of people out here, mm-hmm. and we had no symptoms. He had a slight fever one night and took the test and it was positive and then we knew that three days later I was going to get it but it wasn't hard we just um, sequestered ourselves and ordered in and and, uh, and are okay and it's an experience that a lot of people I know have had yeah um, I think it's been very hard on the film business yeah, it, it's it's funny too, you know that that's been happening a lot in California. People getting vaccinated and still getting it. Right. I, I think it's because people in California just see life as one big party. It's just it's hard to resist. You know what I mean? Like right. Everybody wants to be social and see each other and get together. You know, it's 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 very hard for Californians, I think. But um, yeah, I mean, I I got you know all my vaccinations, and you know I've had like you know like today I have you know. You know, my sinuses and my throat, you know, I'm clearing my throat a lot. I have that, but I haven't really gotten any COVID at all. Right. You know, I've, I've been tested and all of that stuff. Right. I mean, every time, every time you cough, you think, oh, my God, should I test myself? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. And I see on Facebook you're a pretty keen Wordle player. Oh, yeah. 
I got hooked by that. Yeah, that phenomenon, you know, I, I noticed it's mostly women playing that I see on Facebook. It's like it's like when Tetris came out, you know, it's like... It's, yeah, but the problem with Wordle that's so stupid is that it's so much chance. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, you don't have to be smart. You don't have to know anything. You just have to inadvertently pick the right letters. Mm-hmm. You know when you start. Yeah, it's 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 like a Facebook phenomenon that just that snuck up on us. Like I can't even remember when it started, but it's been going on for at least a solid two years at least. Right, has it been two years? It seems like it. Yeah, like right, yeah. like right when the pandemic was was happening. Yeah, and I think the New York Times bought it for millions of dollars. For, for millions of dollars, is that true? I have no idea. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's like a new crossword puzzle. Yeah, which I do also. Oh, those are fun. I know. I can't believe those are still in um, in newspapers. But uh, the the interesting thing is the biggest change I think is that for me, if I didn't go to a movie theater once a week, at least I went into withdrawal. I haven't been to a movie in a movie theater in three years. I've been to three movies in the last two years. Yeah, well, there you go, you know, and and it's weird. It's a huge change. I know. And and then when you could start going, I didn't want to go because I hate that mask. Yeah. And you had to wear it in the movie theater, so that's two and a half hours of suffocating to, you know, not worth it. Yeah, and also too, you know, I, I mean, I haven't, I don't go to the movies that often, even before the pandemic, because every movie I've seen in the last decade or so has just been awful. <laughs> you right? Know? Did you see? Hmm. Did you watch the Golden Globes? I I saw clips of it, and to be honest with you, I mean, the award shows have not been great for a long time, but like, I didn't see where why everyone was so up in arms about it. Um, did you see that movie that, um, I can't think of his name, but it's, it's shot in Ireland. Hmm. Um, and it won, oh God, I can't remember the name of, the Banshee of something or other. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? No, I'll look it up though. No, look it up. Okay. It's, it's. Kind of extraordinary, I think. Yeah. Um, so it won an award last night. Oh, uh, it won! It won the award, <laughs> I think, for the best film, which is interesting because it's very Irish and very slow, <laughs> with some pretty <clears throat> incredible performances and some pretty some incredible scenery and. I don't know. I liked it a lot. Let's see. The the nominations were Avatar, The Way of Water, uh, obviously not Elvis. I'm so sick of Avatar, I can't even (laughs) (laughs) tell. Obviously not The Fablemans. Uh, Tar? I haven't seen it. I want to. (laughs) Top Gun Maverick? No, I I don't know. Let's see. That was for a drama. Um, Oh, the Banshees of In yes. Inishirin. Yes. Yes. Which is kind of an unfortunate way uh, name for a movie because if you can't say it, nobody else can say it either. Yeah. <laughs> I saw the Elvis movie in the theater. Um, me and my mother. I was crazy about him, yeah. but not crazy about the movie. Yeah, well, the thing is, I like the acting, I like the visuals. I didn't like how they kind of bullshitted about the colonel, because across the board, he was known for being a scumbag. Right, right. I didn't like that part of the story. But otherwise, I thought the movie looked great, and it was well acted. He was amazing, wasn't he, that kid? Yeah, I hope, I hope, I, I don't know what the Oscar nominations are yet, but I hope he's in there. Right. Oh, he he won on the Golden Globes. He won the Best Actor. Oh, that's good. So maybe yeah. he will win because usually when you win uh, Best Actor at the Golden Globes, you'll win the Oscar too. Right. So, oh, I know. It seems that's true. It's weird. I hope Tom Hanks uh, is nominated. He, he, I think he needs to win again. 
Right. Yeah. He's in something else now. Um, oh, yeah, where he's like an old curmudgeon or something. Yeah. And, and yes. Like, yeah, Otto or something. Yeah. Yes, good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he, um, I want to see that movie. But, like, yeah, just everything he's in, he's just great. Right. He's probably my favorite actor of all time. It's interesting, yeah. It's not mine. <laughs> I know, it's all subjective. But your your dad's on my list of the great character actors. Oh, good, I'm glad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I thank you so much for coming on today, Jessica, because um, this is just uh, amazing that you're still around to tell these great stories about him. I'm still around. <laughs> yes. And I hope you have uh, a happy new year and a great... Okay, you too, and thanks for reaching out to me. Yes, and a great night, and be safe out there. Okay, you too. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Jessica Reigns, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh my God, Claude Reigns' daughter, what a sweet lady and great conversation there, huh? I'm so glad we got to talk. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.